Before I get started, I'd just like to say that the HUDS project was, con uh, was conducted under contract to, the, to Marco on behalf of the Mid-A Ocean uh, planning process. And the products that were generated from this effort are being considered by the RPB for use. However, this information reflects the view uh, primarily of our project team. So just real quickly, I'd like to say thank you to our project team and acknowledge others in the room who have helped us throughout this process. Um, we, uh, the contract team is a joint synergy between RPSASA and CPLAN, and we have members here from both organizations. Rachel Schmuckler is here, and she's going to be helping me throughout the uh, presentation. We also have Stephanie Mora and Peter Zaykowski from CPLAN who um, have assisted quite a bit in this effort. And there was one more person at ASA I wanted to just say out loud, Zach Singer Leave It, who couldn't make it here, but was really great and a, a powerhouse of information for us through this process. We'd also like to acknowledge the Data Synthesis Work Group, who served as our steering committee, our co-chairs, Laura and Mary Boatman, um, also Jay O'Dell, who was our technical lead in the room and the rest of the data portal team uh, for being so wonderful and, and our synergy with them throughout this process was excellent and their support was needed for the success of this project. So without further ado, so earlier today you heard Laura explaining that, um, you know, when you're on the data portal and you're looking at multiple layers on the data portal at one time, it gets a little, it gets, it gets hard fast to make any sense of what's going on or it becomes difficult to inform a decision. So we were tasked by Marco uh, to assist them in compiling and synthesizing this information, primarily the human use data information that they had on the portal. Um, so again, it, it was, it, they were having this hard time informing a decision when you're trying to look at multiple, multiple data sets or multiple layers. So here we are at the end of our project with synthesis products to help, along, to help this along. Um, real quickly, I just wanted to show this picture. This is a snapshot of only three data layers on um, from the Marco portal. Uh, we have the AIS data layer on the recreational boater activities, as well as the renewable energy leases. And you can see, even with three layers on, in areas where you have a lot of overlap, it starts to get a little bit hard to decipher what's going on. So we wanted to make these products for stakeholders, for users of the portal, for Marco, that we could, you know, products that we could use to almost take that confusion out and have a summary of that in a tangible way. So we had four main tasks throughout our project, and one task that was ongoing was project coordination with related efforts and stakeholders. So we've participated in two stakeholder events, one back in September and this one today. And um, we've also been coordinating quite a bit with the other contract teams, the MDAT team and the ROA, uh, throughout where there's crossover future integration of our data products. We've been discussing that. Um, the actual process of developing these grids, we broke this up into three main tasks. The first task was to go out and actually do a data assessment. We looked at all of the human use data, then that inventory that exists on the data portal, and we decided to, what we call, go through a characterization of that information. And I'll explain a little bit more detail what that process was like. The third task was then to actually develop synthesis products and in the form of grids that would be used on the Marco portal. And then finally, documentation. Documentation is very important. So we have a final report. We have fact sheets that have gone along with each of the data sets that we've used in our synthesis. We also have informational um, descriptions of each of the products themselves. So the human use uh, data assessment, this was step one, task one. So there is, I think when we started upwards of 50 different human use layers that were currently on the Marco portal. We acquired each of those layers and we started looking at what was inside of each of these, besides just the spatial data, what attributes were inside of those layers that we could extract out and try to summarize. Um, so this was part of the data characterization process, this data descriptors that we're calling. And 
we found that there was two sets of information. There was data set specific information and then information that's spatially explicit that was connected to certain pieces in these GIS layers. So if we had a polygon, a, spatially piece, a piece of spatially explicit information would be you know, the name of an artificial reef, whereas how that information was documented or gathered would have been a more data set specific piece of information. So we started vetting through all these data sets, figuring out what was spatially explicit versus what was a data set explicit piece of information. That, and that process led us into organizing all of this information into five basic themes. And these themes follow the themes that are on the current portal. So we have fishing, which is primarily commercial fishing, maritime, recreation, renewable energy, and security. So we had developed geo databases for each of those. We created metadata catalogs, and again, one of our end, excuse me, one of the end product, or the end products were these human use data synthesis grids where information within those themes were pulled together. Now, for the data set specific information, that information that applied to every data set we went through and we created these fact sheets, and this is an example of one of them. These fact sheets were designed in an attempt to help people, as they're using these layers on the portal, sort of navigate their way through what each of the data set, what, what parts of the data set they needed to pay attention to while interpreting our grids. So this goes a little bit beyond the regular metadata that gets collected for GIS information. Um, so, for example, the data set that we have here is, is aids to navigation. So we went through, and for every single one of our data sets, we have populated these fields. So we have description, theme, which was maritime, the character of the information, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means in a minute. Um, the source of the data, the point of contact for the data. So when it's used by stakeholders or for ocean planning, people can actually get back to the source person that might be able to answer some questions about that data set and in that context. context. Um, and then we also had a couple other metrics that we put in here, including stakeholder involvement, meaning um, how is this piece of information vetted or introduced to stakeholders? In the case of a lot of regulatory information, it just, it was defined by authority, so those are some of the definitions that we came up with. Um, and then we also have things like vertical impact, completeness, which is, it, it's in relative sense, was it a complete sampling of the uh, population that the survey was attempting to sample? So in other words, is it biased towards near shore areas as opposed to the entire region that we're talking about, which is the entire mid-A? So we came up with kind of a completeness ranking score that would help people while they're looking at these data sets and, and these grids that would kind of help them gauge in a relative sense, you know, are we looking at something that had coverage that, you know, was over the entire mid-A, or was it something that was really only in the Chesapeake? So the current status of the data assessment is it's complete. Um, we have now assembled 64 um, human use data layers that went into the synthesis. Um, and again, those have been uh, organized into our five themes. And we have now completed each of those fact sheets. New data that has been incorporated into the synthesis that um, is new to the portal as well through this process well, actually, these were other ancillary, uh, some of these were other ancillary efforts that were going on but haven't been put on the portal just yet, but we did incorporate into the synthesis. So we have the communities at sea data, which is a data set that's a fishing data set, commercial fishing data set that's based on VTR and fisherman interviews. We've included vessel monitoring system data, which uh, looks at offshore commercial fishing as well. We've also incorporated a new AIS layer for 2013. And we also have acquired from the Navy um, their unclassified or declassified operational areas. So also as part of this whole process, we, we investigated data gaps. We were looking at where we saw major data gaps in human use um, activity data. And this data gap analysis was also guided by our steering committee as what they were also seeing as priorities, what they knew they had gaps in. So part of our um, scope was to see if we could identify those data gaps and see if we could fill them. Um, the three that were identified to us is could we get better shipwreck data, or not better, but increased shipwreck data? 
could we find more uh, resources for sand and gravel, and then also the ops areas. So we did achieve getting the ops areas, which is great, um, even though that was sort of in the, in the workings anyways. But with the shipwrecks and the sand and gravel resources, we realized that, um, and we could talk about this more in the Q&A period, but there are other, at least in the case of the sand and gravel, there was other uh, data collection efforts that are ongoing that don't sync up exactly with our timeline, and we weren't going to get those data products. BOEM is actually undertaking a very large uh, project right now, and it, it seems like that information is forthcoming, and that's one of the best sand and gravel um, accumulations of information that we're going to get, and that is something that would be a next step that we'd want to integrate into the HUDS grids. So in the end, um, of our 64 layers, this is the breakout between each of the themes. And these are the general data sets, the listings, the general data sets that fall within each of those themes. So fishing, we have VMS, CAS, and we did put in artificial reefs in this area as well. Um, aids to navigation, maritime, we, we're looking at aids to navigation, anchorage grounds, um, sand and gravel borrow leases, other uh, maintained channels, lots of stuff from the Coast Guard, really. And then we also have some other areas, the North Atlantic right whales, port facilities, ocean disposal sites, AIS. And the AIS actually even gets broken out further into individual vessel types or vessel type traffic. For the recreation, um, there's nine layers total from the recreational uh, data sets that are on the portal. The boater activities and also boater routes, um, coastal use surveys, um, and then also the participatory GIS, which was collected by the data portal team, or the PGIS, we've incorporated that as well. Energy is primarily renewable energy at this point, so we're looking at the uh, wind air energy areas, planting areas, um, and then also coastal energy facilities are included in that too. Security is danger zones, restricted areas, unexplored ordinance, and then our Navy ops information. So this is just, as we were going through this assessment <laughs> and characterization, we saw some obvious, uh, also some other categories started coming through in all this data. So as far as the types of data that we were encountering, we saw four different types of geospatial data. There's point data, some of the record, like for example, the recreational boater, some of that survey data was point data. We had line data, um, much of that, like an example would have been the sub, submarine cables. We had gridded continuous information, which was you know, things like the AIS data as well as the VMS data. And the gridded continuous data was sort of probably for us the most um, expansive as far as regional coverage was concerned. Um, and it also reflected that data, those data sets actually reflect a true metric of intensity. So not only do you know that that activity occurs there, but you have a sense of how much is occurring there with the gridded continuous information. And then we also have polygon information. Generally speaking, these fit very nicely into two different, we call them data characters. They either fit into the, the point in the gridded where either a human activity, meaning boating, fishing, uh, you know, maritime use, or they fell into this infrastructure category that was either regulatory infra infrastructure, so you know, uh, regulatory lanes, boating lanes, things like that, and then physical infrastructure, which was actual physical installments on the seafloor, like submarine cables. So you can see in this picture here that we have a lot of different, we had a lot of different data types to deal with. Now, trying to synthesize information in this many different formats is not easy to do. And people have tried to do that in the past where they've spread this information or they've used predictive models to try to make surfaces out of them. But, you know, we, we early on, I think we made the collective decision, our team as well as our steering committee, that we wanted to try to keep this a little bit more simplistic as opposed to getting into you know, ranking or weighting things by, um, by either expert or statistics, expert judgment or statistics. So we decided to kind of go down a synthesis road that was a little bit more transparent and straightforward. Um, so the development of the HUDS grids, this gets to the, our next place. 
Now, many of you, I know, were in attendance at the September workshop, and originally we were thinking about building sort of more of a dynamic tool that we would have integrated into the data portal. Since then, we've encountered, since in the fall after that meeting, we encountered a bit of a course change, and it, the, the executive decision was made to, to make these gridded, Pro, uh, more uh, static products where this information was sort of funneled into them. Um, there was just some constraints with the data portal that we weren't able to employ this tool technique that we had originally talked about. But it's the same concept, the same information, just a different um, form of the final product. So specifics on the grids. Um, they're going to be integrated into the table of contents of the data portal. And the grid itself, the pink polygon that is in this map, denotes the extent. And you can see we've overlaid the grid over that. And that is what we have our data now imposed onto. And um, this grid is a 10 by 10 kilometer resolution. And it's the same uh, extent as the MDAT showed their mid-Atlantic region. It matches that region. It also matches their, one of their gridding resolutions as well. So you can see it does make its way up into the major inland bodies of water, and it extends out 200 kilometers for the EEZ. So it includes the entire coastal shelf and further out. Um, and of course, we used Esri ArcGIS to create these things, and we have full FGDC metadata, which is just a, a basic uh, uh, record keeping of the type of um, information that's in here in geographic display. So products, okay, products that we got out of the synthesis, out of the synthesis. We, we had two main products that I'm going to talk about today. The first was data presence, and we'll go through exactly how we calculated that. Um, but it was a real straightforward tally within each cell of how much data was present given the layers that we were stacking up underneath this gridding system that we developed. And, um, one of the features of these grids as they're implemented on the portal is that you can click and point on grid cells. And different layers have different features that pop up in a, a readout table. And I'm going to demo all of this too. Um, but just to give people a sense, we can, the clickable grid cells reveal data presence totals as well as further descriptive information that was pulled from each of the root data sets. Now the second um, product, gridded product, that we went through creating and, and we went through this exercise of generating is what we're calling use intensity heat maps. They basically depict a calculated measure of human use activity. We, we did go through the exercise of creating these heat maps for all of our different themes. However, with the themes that had more of that gridded continuous information, like the AAS data, the VMS data, um, those grids were more interpretable and the end products were much more rich. And we'll go over that as well. I have examples of everything. So the data presence, we'll talk about those, those data sets first, those grids first. This is just a quick schematic to give everybody a sense for how we calculated this or how they were created. We have various data layers underneath. So in this case, the example is recreational boater activities, renewable energy, and AI shipping. We overlaid a grid on top of that. And basically, the grid is smart. And it looks down through at that cell, at every cell in the grid. It looks down through the stacked up layers that we've decided to put in there, in this case, all the data or a theme of data. And it says, OK, do I have data in this cell? Yes. Do I have? data in this layer in this cell? No. Do I have data in the next layer in this cell? So it's a bunch of presence absence um, calculations that go on. And then in the end, we just tally up all of the presence. So we end up with a heat map that basically reflects data presence. So it's just, it's really, it's a count of how much information was in that particular spatial, that particular cell or that particular area. So in the end, for the data presence grids, we ended up with 10 total grids. Um, we have a data presence grid that shows all of the layers, that includes all of the layers. We call that the master grid. Then we also have four or five more grids that are, um, that are according to our themes, so energy, fishing, maritime, recreation, security. We also did 
um, four other iterations of grids where data was separated out between activity versus infrastructure. So that was irrespective of their theme. It was if it was an activity, we made a, we, we, that we siloed that information and created a grid from that. And if it was infrastructure, we did the same. And we even took it one step further to break it out between physical and regulatory. So the data, hopefully I had mentioned before, these grids that we produced will be, I'm hoping, available in the next month or so on the data portal. Um, and we, the, it can be found, the, the live site is here, but right now we can actually show you what some of these grids look like on the staging side of the portal, which isn't public just yet, but we've been working through examples on the staging site and how they may be displayed once these grids and once the data goes live. In the table of contents, we have the different grids are listed, and right now the grid that is on is all data. So this basically is showing you a heat map of those tallies of data presence that I was talking about. So Rachel, could you just show the legend, please? So as you can see, um, the numbers represent, and we do, when we finally do um, deploy this on the data portal, we're gonna need to um, update some of the legend heads for the, or the titles for the legend. So you can see we have a count of data layers. So in this case, up to 39 layers may have been present in one cell. Rachel, could you click on a cell? So we also have this feature I talked about where you can point and click on the grid. And um, what ends up showing up with the all data, with all 64 layers, the grid generated from all 64 layers, is we have, a, we have basically, we have total data layers in this particular cell is 29. And then you have a breakout um, by theme and also by activity or infrastructure. Um, how many layers are present in there. And it's just, it's, it's to give somebody a sense of, okay, I want to look at, you know, 10 different layers, or I want to look at this, I want to look at all the human use data in this area, and I want to understand how much information do I have about phishing, or how much information do I have about, um, you know, infrastructure in this particular area. So it, it's the beginning of that process of investigating how, how much is going on in that area, and what information do I have there? Now some people could also, you could take it a, a step further and you could say, okay, well, the presence of information also could equal high activity, right? If I have a lot of data there, maybe I have a lot of activities that go on there. But in some cases, that's not always true. And we'll get to that in a minute when we look at the use intensity grids. But for the most part, these grids, these, these presence, data presence grids is sort of like the beginning of a user coming onto the portal and just asking simple questions like, how many layers show up in this area? How many different activities show up in this area? So Rachel, could you go, um, we could just go through the next one, which is the energy. The energy, the energy grid only had, um, uh, you know, we only had minimal layers that went in to the energy grid. Um, can you go to the fishing? So here's our fishing data uh, stacked up. Could you click on a cell, please? Thank you. So with the theme grids, we have a slightly different set of information that comes up when you point and click. At the theme level, we decided that we would um, make available to the user more of that descriptive information about that area and pull it out and, and summarize it in these um, scrollable tables. So for example, the first thing that's listed is you have, in this area, you have phishing data. There's nine layers that are showing up. Then you can continue go, to go down and you can say, okay, uh, communities at C, which is CAS, um, that uh, we, we have dredge information. There was, da there was dredge data that came from that data set. Um, and the level, of the level of use was between the 50th and 75th percentile. And you can say the same thing about, and then we also have an inf information about the area of which that dredge data encompassed within that cell. So we had 100 square kilometers of dredge data that was showing up. And then you could keep going on for all the different fisheries. So we have gillnet, groundfish. And then the VMS is a little bit different. It's um, more organized by fisheries management plan. So we have multi-species, monkfish, scallop, surf clam. 
and whatnot. So this just gives you a little bit within this theme, you really get a little bit more information out of these grids from a point and click standpoint. Okay, Rachel, why don't we just um, click through all of the rest of them just so everybody can see what like the maritime data looks like. And then recreation. You can see recreation is very close to the coast because a lot of the data that we had was close to the coast. This is the security data. And um, this was really driven by the Navy ops information because we had very large polygons of information from the Navy. If you look at some of the root data, you know, there's just the, the declassified information is, is, you know, there's very large usage squares. Could you point and click? Maybe right, yeah. So we have warning areas, danger zones, Wallops Island, test track. And then we have a couple of different, from the Navy Ops, there's military range complex, counts, and whatnot. So the security is definitely dominated by the Navy Ops information. So can we go to the next, just let's click on the next few. So here we have, this is just all activity data. All of the infrastructure. Physical infrastructure. As you can see cables, and then regulatory um, infrastructure information, which also included a lot of those operational, Navy operational areas. So these are the data presence grids, um, and this is a, a major deliverable that we're giving to Marco and to the data portal. So the next product were these use intensity grids, and bear with me while I go through how we kind of calculated these. Um, we looked at the presence grids and said, okay, it was sort of like what I was explaining before. Okay, this is going to give me a picture of what data is there, but does it really tell me how much use is there? Does it really say to me, okay, you know, you know, is this a highly used area? Is use intensity great or low? Um, maybe I could assume that because there's a lot of information there, we could, we could go down that road, but in some cases, you could have an area with uh, certain data sets showing up, but actually, in truth, the activity could be quite low. Or vice versa, you could have an area with one activity, which could be one type of fishing, but it could be the most heavily fished square you know, in the entire mid-Atlantic. The data presence grids don't reflect that. They, they just don't show that. So. There was sort of, we wanted to go through this next exercise of trying to um, measure this, this intensity metric. So how we did it, it was a three-step process. We basically identified a single attribute from each of these layers. And remember, we've got a lot of different layers. We have points, we have length of lines. We, have, we could count up the points, we could look at the length of lines, we could look at the amount of area inside of a polygon. Um, or we could sum up the gridded values that were in those, those gridded uh, uh, um, surfaces. So the first step was to go through and figure out what best quantified use intensity where we didn't have any use intensity information. The second was, okay, we better standardize all of this to a common scale. So we went through and we scaled everything um, from a zero to one scale. And then the second was, and that was sort of an attempt to take Apples, as my, as my colleague Zach likes to say, we took apples and oranges and then we made bananas out of them. <laughs> so um, the third step then is um, to add up all of those scaled values, you know, um, by theme, assuming all of these data layers were equal in weight, without putting any, you know, uh, statistical hierarchy of value on them or any kind of expert judgment on them. So. How, how this worked, and this is just a, a quick schematic to, to run through the process, is you have points, a bunch of points. First thing, put a grid over it. And this grid is hypothetical, it's only got four squares. Then you want to sum how many points were in each of those grid cells. Okay. Next is identify what's the max. Five points is the max in this case. So to get those all to a common scale, let's divide everything by the max and you end up with certain values. Now we did 
do this for other types of data as well besides point data. So in the case of point data, we have line data, polygon data, and then here's our gridded continuous raster or grid data, which the metric in those is actually a density. So again, count up what's in the cell, find the max, divide by that max everywhere, and now you have a scaled value. Then we took each of those layers, stacked those up, and summed all of those values down through the layers that you wanted to stack up. So in this case, if we were looking at like maritime layers, which there's many more maritime layers than what we're just showing here, but this is just for example. Ports, cables, UXOs, you want to, you know, the, the, the bottom grid here, 0 0.2, 0 0.26, and 0, all adds up to get to 0.46. So after we've sunned them then, we also went through a quick classification to put them in a high, medium, and low range. So why, we kind of talked a little bit about why we did this. And again, it's because the data presence grids are only good to a certain degree. There comes a point where um, they're, they're, not, they're not supposed to be interpreted at face value for how much human use or what the intensity is in that area. It's really just how much information do we have. And so the intensity grids were our way of trying to solve that problem. We went through this exercise, like I mentioned before, with all the different themes and came to the conclusion that the maritime and the fishing data, because it was dominated by data sets that really had true intensity values associated with them, that gridded continuous information, those were really the strongest maps that we generated and they're the most interpretable. And they're also capturing um, the, the, and depicting what's going on in those areas for intensity the best out of all the themes that we uh, went through this exercise with. So it's a simplistic approach that doesn't involve expert opinion. And one thing that is very important to understand too Spatially, there's a lot of data gaps in, in, in much of this information that we're compiling. And we haven't corrected for those data gaps. So for example, you may have data sets that are biased towards the shoreline, towards the coastline. The recreational data is a great example of that. Um, that could be true, um, but it's also because we haven't gone that far offshore to actually survey the area. So it's not necessarily that no fishing or no recreational activities go on there, it's just we haven't collected data there yet. So that would be considered a data gap. So this methodology, this um, use intensity methodology that we employed, doesn't correct for those data gaps. So the limitations, some of the, that limitation that exists with the data presence grids also exists with the use intensity grids. So um, in our reports and in our discussions of use of these grids, we're trying very hard to put forth to the users um, that, you know, while interpreting these heat maps that we're about to look at, you really do need to kind of internalize that and take that and understand it. So I encourage all of you that if you do get into looking at these, you know, investigating the root data that's going into these synthesis grids is pretty important. And those data fact sheets that we generated, I think, serve as a good ground truth or counter. It's something to look at while you're looking at those synthesis grids in each data set to understand what are the limitations of the data sets that went into each of these synthesis grids. Okay, so here, this is the maritime, um, both maritime grids that we generated. Um, on the left is the data presence, and on the right is the use intensity. Down here on the bottom are all the different layers, and I'm, I apologize for the smallness of the font, but these are all of the different layers that, again, went into the maritime theme. So as you can see, they're very different. The two maps are very different between the data presence and the use intensity. And you can, you can start to see what's going on in the right is that you can actually see the AIS data and some of that other infrastructure information that we've included in the maritime category. That when you, it's, it's like those trends and those pathways are starting to come through. So we do feel that this is a pretty good representation of maritime use intensity for the mid-A. Um, and so now this is fishing. So you can see fishing follows a similar trend between the two, but 
by going through the use intensity calculations and standardizing everything and trying to take into consideration that level of use, you can see that um, you know, the area that's around the canyon and offshore, the shelf, you really start to see that actually, in fact, those are ranked higher in use intensity when you start looking at the metrics that are inside of the communities at sea and also the vessel monitoring data. Um, so one thing I think is important to point out is First, with these, with these data sets, is we don't have hardly any fishing information near shore or up in the bays, where we've also included, you know, gridded area. So you can see the Chesapeake Bay, really, um, we don't have a lot of intense fishing information that's included. And this is because the data sets that we've used are primarily offshore commercial fisheries. So I would say when one is interpreting this map that you know, we probably have a pretty good picture of what's going on on the shelf here, but it's pretty important to caveat that, you know, to the users, we, we really, we're, we're, we're lacking a lot of information closer to the coast. Um, and again, it's, it's important to think about what each of these maps say. The first map says, okay, this is a, a measure of how much information we've collected in that area. And the right map really gets more at, this is the level of actual use of each of those um, activities. So, in summary, the last task was our final report. We wanted to make sure that we documented our process pretty closely. We also wanted to make sure that the information um, that we generated through the data characterization and assessment um, got got documented in a way for Marco and for the users. And so we, we did go through, um, you know, highlighting what each of these data sets contain. Um, we, uh, we also have a good discussion about data gaps, and we also have a discussion about future uses um, that we potentially see coming down the road that where we may be thinking about where we want to collect data in the future and, and how that could get integrated into a next iteration of the HUD's grids or human use intensity metric like what we've generated here in this exercise. Um, again, we've also, we've added a couple new data sets to the, to the collection, AIS and VMS. There's a new AIS data, data set. So we've documented those two data sets within the report, summary of data gaps, again, um, and then also uh, the methods that we developed, the grids, um, and then a pretty good discussion of um, just sort of some of the things that I talked about here, the limitations of the grids, the, um, what the grids are good for, where you should apply them, and, and what, in what context should you be interpreting these products. And then we also have um, a user guidance appendix, which I'm hoping can actually be sort of a snippet that we take out and could be a link to, you know, on the portal that people, users can go to and click and um, actually run through a quick guidance, user guidance of what these grids are, what the explanation of them are, some descriptions, it'll list out what data set went into each. And then, of course, the fact sheets for each data set, which right now we currently have included as an appendix in the report too. So with that, um, I just, I'd like to say thank you very much for your attention. I